So good afternoon, everyone who joined us online and uh, everyone who is participating in our lab as well. Uh, today we're here for the third part of the I'm thinking unlearning theory section, which is unlearning. And uh, as a guest today, we have uh, Jakob Eriksson, who is the Danish born and Berlin based sound artist and uh, researcher who's currently working on his PhD at the University of the University. Uh, and uh, yeah, and living in Berlin. That's what I wanted to say and uh, giving some lectures as well. Jakob, hello, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I would say without any further introduction, we can give you the words and we're happy to have you. All right, we have to go through this uh, ritual of uh, sharing screen. I hope that it will work without any problems. So do you see my screen now? Yeah, yep. Very good. Yes, so um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really, really an honor to be invited to this uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm thinking on learning. Um, it's, it's really an amazing group of, of sound researchers and uh, artists to be among. Um, and great that it can uh, that is possible to, to, to collect them only from Germany and, and Russia, though they're big countries. So uh, very big thanks to, to you, Stas, and the rest of the team behind on Thinking and Learning um, for making this happening. Um, it's it's a, great, a great thing to do. Um, today's lecture is the final in the series. Um, this does put me under a certain pressure as you all might be a, a bit overloaded with input from the former lectures. Um, and workshops, and at the same time, we should also expect to finish off with some kind of fireworks. So I will do my best. Um, Stasio introduced me very well. I'll just uh, say a bit more. So yeah, my name is Jakob Eriksson. I have a background in musicology from uh, University of Copenhagen, um, philosophy from York University in Toronto, and, and sound studies at a Berlin University of the Arts um, here in Berlin. So I'm a sound artist, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher. Um, as, sound art, uh, as a sound artist, I do performances, I do installations and conceptual sound works. Um, I mostly work with synthesized sound, such as in Max MSP and uh, modular synthesizers. Um, though I also often incorporate uh, or re relate acoustic or env environmental elements um, as, as like opposed to synthesized elements. Then I, um, my teaching is uh, mainly focused on uh, sonic post-humanism and, and more than human listening. Um, and also how sound is, um, is in and as artistic research. Um, and currently I am in the process of conducting my PhD research on the topic of what I call the post-human attitude in sonic arts. And today's lecture will derive from, from this research. Um, I hope we have time um, for, for discussion after my presentation, or I'm, I'm sure we can create some time for that. Um, so please uh, note any questions or, or comments so we can address them afterwards. So today's lecture, the title of this lecture is Sound as More Than Human Relation. Um, and as I have stated in the description, I will focus on sound as a means of relating between humans and non-humans. Specifically, I will address how sound and contemporary artistic practices are used to establish trans-specific communication and how these approaches might differ from similar attempts to address the non-human through sound and music up until now. 
drawing on, on a current theory and a critical post uh, humanism and sound studies, I'll then discuss how um, more than human relation um, as a concept is an alternative notion to the established dualism between nature and culture. Um, so as an entrance to, to this sound as more than human relation, I want to take I want us to take a few moments to, to reflect upon two mantras. And the first mantra is, more than human listening is multidirectional. You are never, a, you are never the only listener around. The ears of, of the other are not your ears or like, or like your ears. Attunement is never ending. Listening is always situated and relational. Listening is never objective. The second mantra. Prepositions are important. We never relate to the world, but we always relate in the world. And the active of that is to relate with the world. So in, with that in mind, um, in this lecture, I will present three artistic examples of sound as more than human relation. They are by the artist Maria Fernando Cardoso, Thomas Saraceno, and Elena Morgan. But before coming to them, I'll briefly lay out the problem of the dualism between culture and nature that I proposed before. So basically, that what we know as the Cartesian divide between uh, the mind and the body, which was reinforced by Immanuel, Immanuel Kant um, and his uh, subject-object dichotomy, has led the ground for Western thinking up until today. Uh, up until today. The mentality or the episteme as in Foucault towards this dualism of the culture versus nature the subject versus object has taken different forms uh, in different eras. I'll not go through all of these eras or their aspects here, but I would like to highlight two of them, um, and that is uh, Romanticism and Modernism. Um, and I'll try to show their, their similarities and their differences. So the important characteristics of Romanticism is that it's focusing on subjectivity and individualism, spontaneity, freedom of rules, um, solitary life rather than life in society, the beliefs that imagination is, uh, imagination is superior to reason and devotion to beauty, love and worship of nature, and fascin uh, fascination with the past. In Romanticism, nature is thus perceived as something detached from humans, but still striving for a harmonic relationship with nature as a myth, uh, a spirit, and as monster. So we have like a, a, a clear divide between the human as romanticizer and the, the nature as kind of this harmonic goal uh, that needs to be um, strived for. So then we have, um, or I create this uh, uh, um, parallel to, to um, modernist idealism. So on the other hand, modernist idealism uh, has roots in enlightenment uh, and is a counter reaction to romanticism. The characters of modernism, modernism are, are belief in reason and logical thinking as a method towards realism. Society is evolving in a linear progress, always on the way to a better world, in, in, in this idealism, of course. 
um, the modernist thinking uh, in, in modernist thinking nature is also detached from human or at least from Western culture and serves as a resource for human advancement. Um, the problem about modernism is that it is colonial, it's patriarchal, it's capitalist um, in its way of conceiving the world, which is damaging the planet and its life uh, by its powerful uh, by its power structures, not powerful structures. They are also powerful. The production of modernism is conservative, Eurocentric, and neoliberal uh, in its power structural dualisms that places men over women, straight over queer, white over colored, reason over religion, abled over disabled, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so in, in this hierarchy of who are more or less human, so this is, of course, needed to be challenged. And uh, at least since the beginning of the 1980s, counter concepts such as ecofeminism, actor network theory, and uh, post-humanism and the Anthropocene has uh, established. Here I see the, the important um, theorists uh, in, in Donna Haraway with her The Cyborg Manifesto and Staying with the Trouble. Karen Barad with meeting the universe uh, halfways and Anna Tsing with the mushroom at the end of the world. We also have uh, Rosie Braidotti with the post-human and Bruno Latour with we have never been modern and facing Gaia, just to mention a few of the most influential uh, thinkers um, reacting uh, towards um, the, the dualist thinking of, of modernism. So, how, how, how are they establishing a field here? So um, in their perspective, of course, they, they differ uh, between each other, but they kind of go in the broadly said, like very broadly said, in the same direction. Um, and that is that uh, they're believing that the always evolving, moving, establishing, eroding, mutating, uh, transforming, interconnectedness of the mesh and the blob of relational threads and glue which the world consists of um, is often described as entanglements. So this is really a buzzword that we always hear. So every, everything is entangled and uh, we have to um, see that as a, 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 a worldview. Um, I am trying to to widen out the perspective of, of entanglement a, a tiny bit here with my talk. So the world as entanglement instead of world as human culture separated from nature. Um, the, 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 the current pandemic as well as other pandemics um, and the global climate crisis and their societal and geopolitical consequences are, are just a few examples of how an ontological epistemology of entanglement is, a bit, is, is of better use than uh, the modernist uh, nature and, and romanticist uh, nature culture uh, divide. So I think it's important to have like that as a frame, a theoretical frame, in order to address the, the um, artworks um, that we will come to now. And um, all of the three artists I am addressing in this uh, uh, talk are working with spiders. And why spiders, uh, we might ask. Um, it's because uh, spiders, they don't have ears like humans or other animals do. But that doesn't mean that, they, 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 that spiders are not auditory be beings. So a spider, um, a, a spider has its web. So the web is its extension of its body and it uses, uses this web for communication and for sensing its surroundings through physical vibrations. So that means that they don't have ears like we do, but they have their body, they have their legs, they have um, their web and all that vibrate and they can perceive that um, as a physical vibration. 
So a spider in its web can, can, can thus determine whether prey has been caught, a predator is approaching, or also for mating purposes. So the communication between the interested male spider and, and the soon to be seduced female spider takes place through vibration in, in, in this web. Um, and hereby we come to my first um, example from uh, Maria Fernanda Cardoso, and it's called On the Origins of uh, Art 1 and 2. It contains sound, so if you have headphones, please use them because they can be very subtle um, and also going into the bass frequencies. So uh, please find some headphones now and then I'll play this um, video uh, in a few moments. The video will be um, a little less than seven minutes.
All right, so what we were looking at here and listening to here was the, the peacock spider, which is one of the few spiders who can actually uh, uh, see and communicate also through seeing. So you can see all the, the, the colorful uh, bodies they have and showed off like a peacock in this amazing dance they have. Um, they were placed on a, a plastic uh, surface like this plate. And uh, as you saw in the very last part of the second uh, uh, video, um, there was this laser pointing down to the surface. And, and that is the very sensitive uh, microphone that, that picks up the, the, the very subtle vibrations that uh, we, as a human being, would never be able to, to listen to with our ears or, or, or even our, our hands, um, I could imagine. So that also brings us uh, to, to the qu uh, question, what is, what is happening here? Um, how is this interspecies communication? We didn't communicate uh, a lot. Um, and, and that's also uh, right. But I think the first step of communicating is to establish a, 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 a means or a medium in which we can com communicate. And what uh, Cardoso here is doing is really like putting the spider uh, outside of in its environment in a white uh, uh, cube type of setting, observing uh, and learning what what are they doing, like really like getting to know it, uh, the, the other, the spider in, in, in this case. And um, listening and listening a lot and listen, listen carefully. That, I think that's very the, the very most important thing of the uh, establishing um, uh, this interspecies connection that communication um, needs. Not just listening with our ears, but also listening with our eyes. That's called seeing, and like all the the, the senses we have, um, awareness and attention. Um, we also saw that. Um, scale is a factor so uh, i mentioned that the the sound is amplified we saw that uh, there was a finger in in the middle of of of, um, of the video like so we could see what, how small the, the the spider actually is um in in the exhibition uh view you can see that it's um on on this big screen so actually there in, in this photograph, at least, um, that's a, a video documentation of the video uh, in the installation. Um, you can see that the spider is on a, it's the same size as a human being. And I think that's very, very much on purpose. So it's not on a, on a small screen, but it's like zoomed up so we can kind of relate to a, 
a being that is on uh, our same uh, size. Um, the next example is Thomas Araceno, the Argentinian uh, um, artist. He's not uh, just working with sound, either is Cardoso um, or Cardoso. Um, but he is working a lot with sound in connection to spiders. He's in general working a lot with uh, uh, spiders. Um, but what I, my interest is that a lot of people have been, been writing scholarly uh, papers on, and, and giving talks about this um, idea of working with spiders as a metaphor and their webs as a metaphor for, for networks. Um, but I'm more interested in what, what is happening uh, sound-wise. And um, one of the more recent examples is, um, is this one called How to Hear the Universe in a Spider slash Web, a live concert for slash by um, in vertebrate rights. And um, I think we should watch uh, a part of it because it's uh, 20 minutes long in total. Um, if you have a, a, a smartphone, you can download uh, the app called uh, Arachnomancy, uh, and there you can watch the whole uh, video. So um, we will watch uh, also like five, six minutes of it.
All right, so what is happening here is, is a more musical approach um, to, to the spider. So um, it's not as clean uh, observatory as uh, Cardoso's example, um, but it's more like a, keeping this mysticism uh, alive, a bit romantic in a way um what what is this world of the other what is the world of the spider um and in 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 in, in that way um saraceno is is adding this play, playfulness with uh, which i think is a very important part of 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 a relating to anything like if we cannot play like bound back and forth forward um it's difficult to relate then it's very Hard, scient uh, hard time scientific, um, but the, the, the naivety and the joyfulness of, of, of play, um, I think that's an important uh, part of, of relating to anyone. Um, like also just between uh, human beings, you, you are always relating more to the person who smiles back at you um, of course, you can you can can have empathy with a uh, sad faces as well, but that's a, a, another thing. But for a first meeting, you you want this playfulness also established. Um, so it's not strictly uh, scientific uh, as this is how sound uh, how uh, the sound of spiders uh, is, but it's a musical interpretation. So you could hear that it was a, evidently added some reverb. If you if you um, put a microphone like this um, a laser microphone on the spider web and and record the vibrations, you will not get that reverby sound. So that has been added in post production. Also, there were some spatial uh, parameters you could hear, like there was warping around, um, and also um, suddenly we were introduced to the universe. Um, so if we 
look in the app uh, we can see we can listen to to some of the um, some of the, the samples uh, used and uh, here is uh, here are some of them um, and as you can see like we have uh, earth vibration pre and post lockdown so I comment on on, on the pandemic uh, and then we have spider web building vibrations with spider plucking vibration with spider percussion drumming then we have solar storms we have CMB cosmic wave uh, microwave uh, background and we have gravitational uh, waves um, and so on and that leads of course for me but maybe not everyone uh, aware of it but like it leads us back to Pythagoras and and um, and uh, the idea of uh, musica univer universalis or harmonies of the spheres which was reproduced uh, for a long time like Pythagoras was between um, 570 uh, to 400 and 95 before Christ, um, but all up uh, through um, to, to, to the Middle Ages and, and after that, uh, for example, with uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, who lived uh, 1571 to 1630, and also uh, Athanasius Kircher from uh, 1602 to 1680, they, they uh, uh, believed in, in these harmonies of the spheres or, or that nature had a, a harmony in, in itself. Um, so the funny thing about Kirscher that, uh, uh, that he is also, or he also did this uh, harmonies of the spheres as a music theorist and composer and science, uh, man of science um, was that he was not working with spiders, but he was working with birds. So he, um, he composed uh, uh, organ music based on the voice or the, the songs of birds. Um, and we might not be very shocked about that behavior that we, we also see that by Messian and, and others, like that's very one-to-one -to, -one to, to translate whatever we are hearing in the nature and translating it into to, to scores. But he also did the other way around. He um, took his own uh, organ exercises and composed them for birds in order to communicate to the bird like please sing this uh, uh, small uh, melody um, and that kind of breaks with the the, the, the whole timelines of, of, of what we're trying to establish here with the entanglements and we are uh, uh, progressing and progressing and progressing um, but it fits anyway because the progression is um, a modernist uh, a, a notion so the progression towards ever be always evolving um, so that's a, a, another aspect of, of this entanglement um, theory that uh, it's not linear it's non-linear it's um, it comes from everywhere um, there's not a right or wrong there's no hierarchy in, in that way it's not uh, either or it's um, both and, or as Baidotti, Rosi Baidotti says, it's and, 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 um, indef indefinitely. And um, um, there I lost it. All right. Um, so, oh yeah, that's what I wanted to say was that another similarity between a uh, Kirscher and uh, Saraceno is that art is seen as research. Um, so Kirche was, I think, um, pretty alone. He, he put his name on, on the scores in his books. Uh, Saraceno also put his name on, on, on his artworks, like Studio uh, Thomas Saraceno. But it is Studio uh, Thomas Saraceno. And that studio implies that, OK, th this is a bunch of artists, researchers, um, musicians, uh, philosophers, and, 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 and so on, that contribute to the whole artwork. So it's not just Thomas Arsenio creating an app, creating a, a, a composition, creating an installation. It's a, an entangled uh, work together in order to create this whole universe of, of a relation of webs of spiders. 
Um, so that is on a very big scale with a lot of technology, um, with a lot of uh, research uh, and a lot of publications. If you go to his websites, he has uh, several websites documenting his research on spiders and, and on air and then and other stuff. Um, like you can spend days there uh, uh, reading uh, different uh, papers from, from, from different people and watch videos and so on. Um, another approach is from um, Elena Morgan. She's there. And yes, we have some time. So um, she made this uh, piece called Serenading Spider in 2013. Um, it is very much different uh, and much more personal than, than uh, Thomas Sarseno. And, and I really like this contrast. Um, we'll watch the video. It should be around six minutes. And it's very slow um, and very meditative. So here we go.
My love is like a wild red rose that's newly sprung in June. My heart is like a melody that's sweetly played in tune. So. So deep in love am I, that my love is still my dear, till all the seas can dry. Okay, so um, this is uh, a very poetic piece uh, and somehow much more radical than the two other pieces because um, how would you observe a, a spider and find out how to, to communicate with it? Um, of course, you would use uh, scientific methods, but this is not her approach, Elena Morgan's approach, though she wrote a whole book on the project. Um, on, on spiders, not just the sound of spiders or how to sing to spiders, but on spiders in general also. Um, so um, the setup is pretty simple. Uh, Elena Morgan has this wooden frame. She placed it in her garden uh, and uh, around a spider web. And overnight, the, the spider has then established a, a, a full blown uh, a web in, in the frame. Um, so next day, she's uh, sitting with the frame with the spider in its web and connecting, you saw that in the beginning, connecting with a, a string of web, um, her, her neck here to, uh, to the spider web. So she knows that they commu communicate uh, through vibration. The spiders communicate through vibration. And of course she can also do that with her voice. So that is like the experiment. Um, so first she is tuning in to the spider, like kind of what, what happens. Uh, trying out. That's kind of the first part. Um, then she is uh, establishing more like droney, like long, longer uh, notes, trying to, okay, is there, is there one a, a specific frequency that the, uh, would resonate with the spider where we can communicate? Um, and then, of course, uh, in the end, uh, she was singing a, a song. A, 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 a love song from her uh, childhood. So in this way, um, we can talk about uh, a communication with the more than human uh, as kind of becoming the other in, in, in Deleuze and Guattari's uh, uh, terms. So becoming animal or becoming spider. Um, but of course, there, there, there will always be this boundary between Eleanor Morgan, the artist, and the spider in, in the frame, in the web. Um, so maybe a more useful term would be Donna Haraway's becoming with spider. And I think that's a very, um, that's the key notion of, of this more than human uh, relation, um, the, the with, um, becoming with spider. And then the question is also if the spider is becoming with human, does the spider understand what is happening or doesn't it uh, care at all? We wouldn't uh, know necessarily. There was some reaction though. Um, so it was also for her a project of facing her own fears. She uh, suffers from arachnophobia. So this relating to the other through sound or in, in general is also like the facing of oneself. So by understanding the other, you, you often uh, reflect on, on uh, yourself in, in, in the same time, or that would be the, the, the best case, of course, if you, if you did that. Um, okay, so we are coming to an end. If entanglement is the answer to the problem of the nature-culture divide, 
uh, that is that uh, as an onto epistemological model of reality then what i will add to it is that uh, more than human relation would then be the activity of becoming with i'll repeat that so entanglement in, in itself is of course morphing and 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 moving and uh, all around but the activity of becoming with um, is what I propose here with uh, the more than human relation and relating as an active uh, or an activity. And also in, 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 in the same step of, of uh, becoming with, uh, we, we create this double mirror or a resonant room, not an echo, echo chamber, but a resonant room with open doors, or open windows. Um, and an and awareness that something can happen there. So I'm not saying that hearing or listening or sound is superior to other senses. Sound and listening is uh, one among, uh, amongst many possibilities to relate in uh, and relate uh, with the world. Um, and we have to be uh, aware of that, of course, that, that it's not a wonder uh, medium um, that is just one of many doors. So to wrap up the points, um, in this perspective, more than human listening and sound becomes a highly ethical matter uh, that is uh, uh, acknowledge, uh, acknowledging uh, the world in which we live and are part of as always entangled, interwoven, interconnected on multiple levels, um, and not divided into dualism, uh, a dualism between nature and culture in and for themselves. Compared to other ph phenomena and senses, do sound and listening not bring us closer to any reality? Instead, it is important to be aware of the sonic realms of and in the world as one of several possibilities for the human to conceive the world as, uh, as a way to understand and to a certain degree, communicate with the non-human um, in a more than human relation. So we are here coming to an end of my lecture. I want to finish off with the mantras from the beginning of the lecture. Maybe they sound a bit different now. Maybe they should have been stated as questions. Mantra number one. More than human listening is multidirectional. You are never alone, no, you are never the only listener around. The ears of the other are not your ears or like your ears. Attunement is never ending. Listening is always situated and relational. Listening is never objective. Mantra number two. Prepositions are important. We never relate to the world. We always relate in the world. And the active of that is to relate with the world. And by that, thanks for your attention and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Jakob. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Amazing. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that was really, really interesting. And the examples were amazing. And all the things you said was also really good. Uh, yeah, so I think if we do have any questions, uh, we will proceed to this. First of all, uh, I think <laughs> I have my right. Uh, I will just ask the, the first question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, you were you were telling about this uh, what called the correlation right between the between the mind and the being so this uh, can't thing that we could, we could we can't avoid so we couldn't avoid until a certain uh, until a certain degree also so and uh, yeah and as you said what the so-called speculative realism or the so-called flat ontologies or everything that relates to this uh, concept they offer this new uh, yeah so the new insight on how to yeah how to interact with it 
But then I also thought that, uh, yeah, even though there are different strategies to, um, yeah, to understand this uh, mysterious life of, of, of objects, whatever, whatever you, you can call it, the thing in itself, the world in itself. So we're still kind of, uh, we've, we keep finding ourselves in, in, in the middle of this thought process, process. And even if so, like, like printing the assumed says that like, the scientific methods are important. So we can, we can, we can at least speak about that. But, or like some uh, more fancy <laughs> writers like Eugene Thacker, they, they say that like the fear could be this strategy. And uh, yeah, and I still like listening to, to your talk, I was always wondering, do you have any examples where sound becomes this, this, this agent? So where, where, is there, are there any artworks or maybe not even the artworks, are there any examples from our life when uh, this agency of sound is becomes like, you know, uh, evident or becomes obvious? Mm -hmm. Um, yes. Okay. So first of all, I didn't mention any speculative uh, realists or triple O's or anything like that. The nearest we come to that would be uh, Bruno Latour, which is like uh, has been doing works with um, Harman. Um, so I'm not really um, subscribing to their ideas per se, though they are very interesting. The the questions they state. Um, but my problem with them is that they say that this is, there's this quest, uh, question that um, uh, we have always talked about, uh, no, we've not always talked about correlationism, but that's me Asus, a term of what we have always been, how we have always been talking. So we're always relating um, and there's nothing out of, outside of relation. Um, and then he is asking for how do we get outside of relation? because there must be something. But I think there's a fallacy in, 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 in the idea of that, um, that we need to get outside of relation. Of course, we cannot uh, perceive or know everything as human beings. That would, that would be a, 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 a utopian thought. Um, but by establishing this critique, he is also establishing the gap. So actually what he's critiquing is becoming in his sense real, like there is a gap. And I don't know what, what is real or not, but I can suppose a, or, or, or suggest um, another, another strategy. And that is uh, saying that, okay, we, we, we are in it together, we can relate. Um, and that doesn't mean that what we cannot relate to is not there, it just means that we, we can relate to something and then that is what we can come in contact with. Um, and the rest, what, what is outside of, of the, 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 the realm of, of, of uh, like this speculative realism, um, maybe it cannot be perceived and maybe it is perceived all the time. Um, I think it's a good exercise to, to, to have this attunement and awareness and this meditative approach to the world and openness um, because we can maybe perceive much more than if we think that we can never come to something that is the thing in itself um, and an example of that like i have i have an example from denmark uh, there's an artist called goodipel i don't know if you're aware of him a um, very eccentric artist and he had um, he had a, a great a, a project um, like 10 15 years ago um, about radical computer music so it's kind of the the, the Atanasius Kircher concept of uh, turning the thing around like instead of notating the birds and uh, then writing music for the birds so what he did he was instead of com uh, uh, composing music uh, on his uh, computer, he was a professor in, in computer music uh, at, a, at a conservatory in, in, in Denmark. Um, so he uh, turned it around and said, okay, radical computer music is trying to find out how we can entertain 
the, the computer as a system, as a network. There might be an intelligence in, in the computer itself. And that is for me the, the, the real speculative um, and, and relational, like trying to do that, trying to imagine, okay, I have this potential of an intelligence that I know maybe a bit uh, about its bits and, and, and pieces and parts, but I don't know how it is to be like a computer. Um, and I think the, 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 this exercise of trying to compose music for a computer entertainment um, or other inter intelligences entertainment is, is it's maybe more an, a, a direction I want to go with because it's more artistic, it's more fun. Um, and fun doesn't mean uh, that it's not useful. Uh, I think in the other way, um, humor is often the door in, in, in to that what we don't understand. Yeah, thank you. I, I quite agree <laughs> with it, I must say. Uh, yeah, this, the, this is another thing I just wanted to ask is that, um, it's maybe a more more practical question for you as a mm. person who's uh, mm. yeah who's researching in the field of sonic arts and both in, in the field of sonic research. Uh, so um, so far, while I've been like, uh, investigating uh, all, all, all the uh, all the themes, all, all the topics you just just tell told to us, uh, it was all the techniques were kind of the same ish so yeah i i mean i totally relate to this idea that the world is a much bigger place so that actually everything is listening around us and we also create too much sounds too many sounds maybe and then uh yeah of course there's a lot of things happening like in in, in the realms of infrasound below 20 hertz in the realms of ultrasound and so on so like you, you mentioned spiders and also ants communicating this the infra spectrum uh, but yeah, what I, what I thought is that the techniques are always kind of the same ish. So what, like for example, what Jana Lindgren is doing is just like the pitch transposing, and uh, so just like if it's below our frequency range, it just you can put it up, and then vice versa. So maybe uh, there are some certain techniques, or maybe something more interesting than just making it uh, listenable for us that we could just yeah. Yeah, sure. Of course, like we have uh, sonification, which is bringing that which is not sounding into uh, a, a human hearing range uh, in the one way or the other. Um, and there are very like a lot of techniques um, uh, in which you can do that. Um, and some of them are very scientific. Some of them are very artistic. Um, Sometimes the word sonification is used like uh, as a more buzzword. Like this is how the universe sounds, or this is how uh, some weather system on on uh, on a planet is sounding, like like NASA is doing uh, often. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's difficult with that uh, a, a term. Um, it's very romanticizing of. Like we can listen to 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 uh, how the, the the world sounds all all this that is not sounding, so maybe we should just like now I'm just thinking about like on from top of my head um, maybe we should acknowledging that okay we cannot listen to all that is audible for others, um, and 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 maybe we could uh, play along like we could sound um, above or below our hearing range. Um, and 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 then make um, concerts for dogs or uh, rats or, or whales. Or <laughs> yeah, thank you. yeah, that would be that would be really beautiful. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I won't uh, ask Anderson anymore because I see that some of our participants already have, have questions. So yes. yeah, Tatiana, please. Oh, are you asking me? 
Sure, sure, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, in the last um, answer, um, Jakob uh, mentioned non-human agents, uh, not only animals, uh, because recently I was engaged in progress in, in a, pro in a um, project uh, that we just put in a pause, uh, considering non-human uh, art. And we have the, the eponymous site, non-human art org. And um, our logic was uh, like almost uh, the same and we stuck in some uh, theoretical kind of questions like who considers uh, that all the, that chirping if we speak about animals as artists who considers that to be an art uh, and is it really art um, what is art then uh, because there are so many definitions and uh, we we just made a two large mirror docs uh, and desks and there were just many many definitions of what is art like actually and who is artist and can a uh, non-human agent uh, or non-human um, agent or non-human subject be an artist uh, we didn't uh, we didn't focus on animals it we had different um, focus on uh, bots and um, robots and uh, ai um yeah and uh, we asked um like several um maybe dozens of uh, theoreticians uh we had a questionnaire about um contemporary definitions of what is that and uh, it seems that like there are two big camps uh, <laughs> of, uh when we answered like of course it's very uh human point of view of what we consider art and uh, birds and animals don't consider these things to be art and like in the first piece that you presented like a uh, male is an artist and the female is a connoisseur like uh, a, a, a very good stereotype and, and uh, according to human point of view and um, we like we stuck in very in, in some things and we uh, according to our logics uh, we created a, manif a manifest to advocate the right of the AI because uh, they are under risk uh, as you know European um, committee has accepted the document uh, that um, um, uh, like not support AI as artists. Uh, it is uh, it puts uh, the same uh, relations uh, on authorship, on copyright, and so on as on human projects, uh, products of art. And it's very strict. It's really very strict. And it was accepted recently. Um, uh, there are no, they are not named uh, animals as artists, but uh, AI and all uh, those rights are really restricted. Um, so the next step, what we were we were going to make um, uh, a petition on change.org, but we stopped there, and we had to work on that our interviews and on our um, things that we had like theory, theoretical. And my question uh, to you is, how do you think uh, what uh, what is art considering uh, to uh, in, consider in consideration uh, to the animal world, who considers them to be art and um, uh, are animals really artists and can they be and um, like as we can't hear as bad as Thomas Nagel uh, can see as Thomas Nagel thinks uh, like uh, who is that art we produce for and really how to produce art for Alexa, Siri uh, and Alice and all those uh, our assistants. Um, I can share here in chat, uh, like our very raw uh, project. Yeah. Yeah, please do. Uh, very, very interesting. I would love to hear more about it. So uh, please share it in, in, in the chat. I'll have a look into it. Um, it's always like a really, really big question. What is art? art? <laughs> and what is art to, to, to different um, um, beings? So, like just in, 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 in the human realm, uh, there's no agreement of what art is. Um, of course, we have uh, certain uh, understandings of art in here in Germany and uh, in, in, in Russia and uh, the, the Western world, I think is pretty like, they, they have their uh, art concept, um, very established uh, through different uh, aesthetic theories and, and, and the history of that. Um, 
but then we go to uh, the other parts of the world where art, um, for example, music cannot be disconnected from dance, which is in in in, in the part of the world where where, where I am living, uh, that is not necessarily connected because you can go to a concert uh, and, and, and be seated and like very still sitting and you, you can't do anything bodily, you can just listen. But other parts of the world that, that is, that you cannot take dance away from, from music. So already there we have an inconsistency uh, on the human level of, of what art is and what art does. Um, and I want to answer it with a very vague, but I think the best answer for me, um, and that is uh, art is not either or. I also said it in, 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 in the talk, uh, but concerning some, something else. Art is not either or. Um, it's not one thing or, or, or the other. It's and, 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 and. We can have many different art forms. So I, I, my, my, my perception of art is uh, art for me. So that's very individual, but it can, it can broaden out to, to the culture I, I, I grew up in, uh, or we grew up in. And then other cultures will then have other art forms. And if we accept that, then we can also uh, say that the spiders are artists, but not in a culture that we know about necessarily. So that means that um, I would I would imagine that the spider doesn't have an aesthetic theory. There's not no spider Adorno or, or, or stuff like that. But that we can of course not expect. Um, so it's in its own little bubble a kind of a an artistic expression. So what is art in in, in that way? So it's kind of an expression. It's not all expression, but it's a kind of an expression that is uh, affecting. Um, oneself or the other. So not all affect is art, of course, but that is part of it. It's, it can be entertaining, it can be wondrous, it can be um, uh, disgusting, it can be, um, I, can, I can be drawn into it. And uh, as um, Cardoso uh, uh, also proclaims is that the, 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 the spiders, both male and female, are artists because they can communicate through art in, in that way. Um, so, yeah, so everything is art. <laughs> Everyone can be an artist, but, but not the same kind. I think that's the important uh, thing to say. Difference of kinds. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if anyone else have their questions you can ask well i have a question too uh thanks thanks for the talk it was great and actually i had a question but it was partly uh answered so uh, and as tatiana asked and stas asked yeah i think uh it's interesting to me um, well how far uh we can go in uh, relation to or with uh, inanimate objects and well of course you partly answered that question when you mentioned uh, this music that can be made to entertain so-called computers or i don't know yeah so yeah uh, but uh i'd like to uh maybe you could elaborate a little more and i also have a little comment uh, well, just uh, a little comment to towards uh, the choice of uh, spider as uh, an object of uh, research. I think it's interesting uh, in context of the uh, mantra that you introduced and according to the first one, as far as I remember, listen is always subjective. Uh, and uh, um, can we call uh, these uh, sensoric uh, perception of uh, air vibration that spiders do uh, via their uh, webs, yeah, uh, can we consider it a listening? And uh, if it's, if we do, isn't it uh, at least more uh, objective than uh, listening that we humans have as our uh, hearing apparatus is uh, much more complex 
and uh, these uh, well vibration is kind of encoded or transformed yeah and it's uh, much uh, further from uh, what we really perceive uh, than uh, in case of spiders I think it's just a little comment I think uh, in this perspective it's very very interesting to kind of uh, study the way they perceive reality yeah and if, uh, as to the question yeah I think I'll, I'll remind you once more uh, yeah uh, how far can we go uh, in terms of mm, a relation to or with inanimate uh, inanimate objects um, thank you so much um, great comments and and, and questions um, there was a lot of it a lot, a lot in, 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 in what you said that needs to be addressed actually so I think first of all that spiders have no uh, more or less complexity in hearing than we do at if, if we understand it as it is as complex as it needs to be for the spider and our listening is as complex as it needs to be for us um, and that's of course developed through uh, many many years um, this system of, of a, a vibratory sensing and that also brings me to that spiders uh, and human beings are not just or human beings are not just listening to the ear we are listening through with our bodies so you can just you go to your loudspeaker, turn the volume up. Of course, you can listen to, your, to it with your ear, but you can also take your, your hand and place uh, on, on the cone. You can then listen with your hand. So that's basically what the spider is doing. Um, so it's just fine-tuned to its environment. Um, that's it. The question was, how far can we go? And I don't know the answer. Um, but I would like to join a journey to see <laughs> how far we can go. Um, but yeah, I don't know if, 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 if that's the most interesting question. Maybe the most interesting question in, in, in that is what questions arises on the journey to, towards how far can we go? Um, and, and that is, um, and also how, how do we do it? Not just the, the the goal, but how how do we get uh, further? Yeah, thank you for your questions and comments. Uh, I have another one question from from the chat. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it's more an ethical one. Oh. <clears throat> uh, so it was. <clears throat> It was about how ethical is uh, that we use and exploit spiders like without their consent to do what we call like arts. But what do you think about it? Well, that's definitely something that you need to consider because they're living human, uh, not human beings, they're living beings. Um, so of course they have to be treated right. That means that you have to understand what a spider is uh, and how the spider lives. So. Um, you have to establish kind of a, a container and an environment that is not harmful to the spider if you decide to work with spiders as a, a part of your, your work of art. Um, it's always difficult to remove something that has not chosen to be re removed from its environment. Um, but I think, I think it's ethic ethical enough if if you just consider uh, having the, the conditions on the terms of the spider and not uh, the, the the ease of of you or your convenience, but the spider's the spider's convenience, which will always be less convenient than in wherever it is living in the first place. Yeah, thank you so much. I just remember one uh, quote from François de Marche, who's this French music concrete composer was uh, I think he was telling about the birds so that uh, uh, there are so many singing birds and if we compare it with the population of professional musicians in France it's like you cannot really compare it so it says a lot about what we call music and what like 
what is the concept of music and the animal itself. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe it's also really an, 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 a really important thing. Yeah, mm, so I think we still have time for one more question. If uh, anyone wants to join the conversation, that would be really nice. Um, yeah, okay, so if, <clears throat> if there's no one, yeah, so that was really interesting, Jakob. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been yeah. a, a real pleasure. We're really happy to have you and all these mantras. I think it will stay with us forever. <laughs> <laughs> we have to develop them. They, they are not finished. <laughs> <laughs> As, yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, uh, in, in, in the very end, so thank you again, Jakob, for uh, joining us for, for this section. I think it was really the best choice to, to close the, the the lectorium as well, to close the theory section, to close the talk. And uh, uh, I would also like to thank the, our colleagues from the Year of Germany who made it possible, Tatiana Klausen and Irina Pinchuk, thank you so much for helping us with all these papers and so on. And to our colleagues from the Universitat der Kunste, uh, Lukas Gulman, who was the co curator also, and Jan Froben, thank you so much. And uh, our colleagues from HSE Art and Design School in Moscow, of course, Yeva, who was Yeva Bobro, who was helping us with technical support, and Gosha Safarov. And, uh, and my co curators, thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Evgenia. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Olga. You were the best. And I think on this note, Jakob, we say thanks to you once again. And thank you for all the participants and everyone joining us online. And hopefully, next time we see you offline, <laughs> anywhere in Berlin or in Moscow, that would, we would be really happy if you, if you come. And Definitely, I would, I would be delighted. Uh, amazing. So then we virtually shake hands and hopefully see you soon, everyone. Thank you for joining us online. It was really interesting and a lot of deep insights during these three weeks. See you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so the broadcast is down. Thank you, Jakob, again. It was uh, really happy to meet you, at least. At least yeah, uh, me too. Me too. At least in this fashion.